It's time for the Bill Ferguson Show. Buongiorno a tutti. Hello, everybody. This is Phil Ferguson, and you are listening to the cleverly titled Phil Ferguson Show. It is now June, and our gloriously delightful, not quite hot and not humid spring looks as if it's coming to an end. So uh, we've started getting some uh, high 80s, and I think even yesterday here in uh, the Chicagoland suburbs, almost uh, strange to say that, but that's where I am now. It was in the low 90s, and we were getting some humidity, so it's time to hunker down and uh, enjoy the summer. Got uh, some barbecues coming up, and just bought a brand new Weber grill. My wife had made some uh, barbecued ribs that were so amazing. I said, uh, you know, I suggested, I asked, I pleaded, nay, please do that again, and she said, not on that little old grill. <laughs> So I bought a new big one. So I'm looking for, forward to some more barbecued ribs in the future. Uh, today we've got a lot to cover, and it's not necessarily what I intended, but sometimes the interviews come and you just can't make them wait. We've got two really big things coming up in the show. Interview with uh, a board member and executive director of Camp Quest. And it's a little late in the season, so I cannot make this interview wait. It's important that you know about Camp Quest, share Camp Quest, tell about your tell it to your friends, and maybe even donate a little money. Uh, the other thing we have coming up, of course, is Aaron Ra, and he and I will be talking at length. And I guess I should have known better. I thought maybe we would talk twenty, thirty, maybe forty minutes. I think we got almost an entire hour in, and I had to make it stop just because the show will get too long, but I think you're going to enjoy it. It's one of those interviews I could sit back and listen to it again. No, not because I'm in there. That's every interview, but because Aaron is in there, uh, we talk about him running for office and politics, and we also talk a lot about the Bible. So I think regular listeners are really going to enjoy that segment. So hang on to that. And of course, before we do all that, I'm going to have a little rant on Comcast, so please forgive me if you just simply adore Comcast and think they're the greatest company ever. You may want to skip it because it's going to bother you. I know what happened bothered me, and hopefully you take that in the intent that that I mean it. It, It's a consumer advocacy thing, and that's kind of what I do. It's not about the specific dollar amount. It's about not getting what you're promised, and that really offends my sensibilities. So the skeptically investing stuff, the whole intro thing, we're going to keep really short. But two two questions that have come up in the last week from emails, and some of them, one of them more than one time, uh, people have talked about uh, different programs, different uh, ideas. One is um, someone had sent me a thing about uh, invest in May and go away. Or I'm sorry, sell in May and go away. I can't even remember it. Uh, there's also the dogs of the Dow. There's all kinds of different ways and strategies that people have culled through the historical data and found trends that tend to, that tend to produce results that are favorable. Whether the market goes up during that time frame and you can avoid it, or whether the market goes down. Uh, I think I said that backwards. Need to get my caffeine in gear here. But there's ideas, and they can prove with historical data that this works. And even if it's true, and even if it continues for a while, once it becomes publicly known, as an example, that the dogs of the Dow uh, had some kind of neat formula that you buy uh, a certain handful of, of Dow stocks, and then you sell them at the end of the year, and you replace them with the new stocks that meet the new criteria, and you get superior results, allegedly. Well, as soon as 
people know that, then the problem is that if you're doing it in December, someone says, hey, it won't work if I sell these in December because everyone else is selling them. So they sell them in the middle of December or the beginning of December or November, and then the entire thing falls apart. So anything that becomes true and has becomes found out in data, even if it actually had value to it, will disappear once it's generally known. And it doesn't have to be 80 or 90% of the population. Once 5 or 10% of investors know about it, it won't work anymore. So if you're an average listener to my show, I mean this in the nicest way possible, you have other shit to do. So by, by the time you hear about it, it's already too late. It's not going to work. This market timing stuff just generally doesn't work. So ignore those things, invest for the long run, index funds, keep your costs low, keep your transaction costs low, and just, it takes time. It just, that's the unfortunate thing about it. The best way to get results in the long run is to have a long run, of course, but just wait and keep your costs low and taxes low. Uh, the other one that I, I got a question specifically, someone said that they were going to retire five years later than they expected. Should they change all of their investments in their target date fund to a target date fund five years later. So this is one of those things that my answer, it kind of, kind of depends. I guess if you are convinced in the philosophy of, or the success of the, the value in target date funds, well, then the answer would be yes. I mean, if, if you're going to use a target date fund and, and this is one of those nuanced points that uh, I have to be so careful about. I am not saying that target date funds are bad. And in case you don't know, a target date fund might say target date or investment plan 2025, 20, 2035, 20, 2055. 20, they usually go every five years. It is a pre-programmed plan where they, the investment company will gradually shift you to more and more conservative investments as you get closer and closer to retirement. They're not awful. We're not talking annuity level problem here. So on a scale of one to 10, one is annuities. Uh, 10 is you knowing fully what you're doing or having a competent advisor using high quality index funds. That's 10. Uh, target date fund, maybe a nice six to eight. They're, they're fine. They're not going to wipe you out. You're not getting screwed. But can you do better? I think this is the case. So if you are a believer in that system and you like that system and you like that convenience or it's the only options you have in your 401k or 403b and that's where the bulk of your money is if you push your your retirement date back five years give or take you probably should move the money to a five-year later target date fund now the other thing that you could do if you fully understand what your expenses will be in retirement and you have a really good understanding of how much money you will need per year, and you look up in the prospectus, prospecti of all the different target date funds, you might find that having one at an even later date is acceptable, and that can get kind of tricksy. But you know, using a theoretical example, this is not a recommendation, but if you have a million dollar portfolio and you know that you need 30 or 40 grand a year from your portfolio in retirement, 300000 in bonds might be sufficient. Please do not read this as an overgeneralization that everyone listening should have 30% in bonds. That is not what I'm saying. This is a theoretical example. In that case, you might want to pick the portfolio that would have 30% bonds at your retirement, which might be different than the date of the fund. So, if you went, plan to retire um, in 2025, but the 2035 fund has 30% of its money in bonds by that year, then that might be the choice for you. So think about it, contemplate it. It's not a horrible thing. Uh, the thing that I really like, especially when you do retire and leave that job, I do want you to get out of the target date fund. And that is because in retirement, you want to have a lot of different investment options that you can sell from year to year because sometimes bonds go up, sometimes stocks go up, sometimes domestic stocks go up, sometimes international stocks do better. 
Sometimes certain types of bonds do better than other types of bonds. And you have all of that flexibility that can easily add one to 2% per year to your performance in the long run. If you have choices, if you stay in the target date fund, you only have one option. You must sell from that fund. So even if half of it's still in the market, if the market falls 40%, your portfolio might fall 15 to 20%. And if you need money out, you've still got to pull it out of that thing. So there's a couple of uh, short investing skeptically topics. We're going to go into the rant and then Camp Quest and then R and Ra. And I know you're going to love all of it. All right, listeners, I've got something different for you here. I've got a little issue. I've got a rant that I'm, I, I guess I must share with you. Comcast. Comcast Xfinity, whatever the fuck they call themselves now. I, I just had an completely unproductive half an hour on the phone with these fucks. You know, I, I moved. I moved recently. Most of you know that. And we've had Comcast for years in Champaign, and everything seemed to work pretty well. Well, when we moved, we contacted them like they tell us they tell me to do, and they say, uh, let us know that you're moving, and we'll transfer your service. So I called Comcast, and I said, you can't transfer the service from that area to the other area. So well, you, all the time you tell us to uh, transfer your service. Nope, can't do it. you got to shut off this service and turn on a new service. Okay, whatever. That's the game you want to play. Fine, we'll play the game. So we set up to cancel all those service. And, you know, when we first closed on the new house, I'm in the new house and I've got everything wired, my modem, my router. Um, and I called their 1-800 number and said, what are my options? What are the services I can get? And they tell me about an absolutely amazing deal for 66 bucks a month. And of course, after a year, it goes up. But for 66 bucks a month, I get a whole bunch of TV channels that I don't want or need. And I get uh, high-speed internet, 75 megabits per second. That's pretty fast. I mean, before I only had 30, it's going to 75. Not that I need 75, but I have 75. And I get two TV converter boxes, um, all for $66 a month. And I'm thinking... Oh, that's cheaper than what I was paying in Champagne, and eventually it goes up. I get that. You know what? Okay, let's do this thing. And they flip a switch. I have internet within minutes, and they said all I've got to do is show up to my local office and pick up two TV converter boxes, whatever we're going to call these. Now, in Champaign-Urbana, there was a local office that I could get to in eight to ten minutes in bad traffic. Well, it turns out the closest office to me while only 12 to 15 miles away, traffic is different in a big city. So it takes me 35, 40 minutes to get there. And I get there half an hour before they open because I'm afraid of what the line is going to be like. Well, I was right because by the time it opened, there's like 20 people in line to go in. But okay, I've already got my package. I've already got my deal. 66 bucks a month. I just walk in and give them my name the number that I wrote down for my account, and they hand me two boxes and I get the hell out of there. So I go up to the counter and I explain this to the young lady, just doing her job. She's a cog in the machine. And they said, you don't get decoder boxes for TV. Well, what, I, what do you mean? That's why, I, that's why I came here. I just drove 45 minutes. I'm out to drive for an hour and a half. Now waiting in line. Two hours. Two hours. I, I got shit to do. Two hours I spend to come up here and get these goddamn boxes. And you tell me I can't even get one because they're not part of my plan. Well, why did the other person tell me? She does not know. I can only get streaming and high-speed internet. So I can stream TV shows, but I can't actually use a converter box. Well, my wife wants at least one converter box. I know this because she wants to sit down and just have a remote like she's always had. And so I said, well, how do I get at least one and so next thing you know, I've got a plan that's seventy nine ninety nine. So I'm paying eighty dollars, not sixty six. And it's not that I don't have eighty dollars. That's not the point. I agreed to something and it changed. And then I only got one box. And so I left, I hook up my one box, and the service is great. I get lots of channels. Again, 
I'm not going to watch most of them. I don't watch a lot of TV. I do now get MSNBC, which is cool, and Fox, which I don't watch, Fox News. But I didn't really want all those channels. But again, it's only $80, and I have really fast internet. So fine, they promised me 66 and it became 80 You know, if they had just said 80 in the beginning, I would have been happy. They could have made me happy, but instead they got to trick me. Well, I get my uh, first statement, and it says that I have to pay $10 a month for renting their modem. I call them up, and I say, I'm not renting your modem. And, oh, we'll take that off your bill. Don't worry about it. I just got my full monthly bill where, amazingly, they gave me $9.67 back because they only prorated it to the day that I complained about it. So I don't get the full $10 back. I never had your freaking modem. It's not the, it's not 33 cents. I mean, 33 cents is not important. It's the principle of it. You charge me for something. Uh, how did you even get the... You didn't send me a modem. I didn't ask for a modem. You don't have a serial number or equipment. Why did you start charging me 10 bucks in the first place? What if I didn't catch that... I could pay $10 a month for something I don't even have. So I'm a little worked up. But I get this bill, and on there there's a broadcast TV fee of $7 and a regional sports fee for $5, $12 extra a month that I didn't agree to or know about. And for my regular listeners, you know, I don't do sports ball stuff. So I'm paying an extra $5 for sports on top of the channels I don't want already. This is... Uh, un- unbelievable. So I'm thinking clearly there's a misunderstanding here and I can't have to pay these fees, right? I didn't pay these fees in Champaign. At least I don't think I did. And so I call Comcast and I talk to them about all this stuff that I'm talking to you about. And they say, well, those fees are a tax. Now, they didn't know that I had already did some research on this. There is no tax. And I asked the person, I go, did you mean to use the word tax? It's actually a tax? And they said, yes, it's actually a tax. It's a tax on your account. And I said, great. Is that a state, federal, or local tax? Excuse me, sir? Well, if it's a tax, who is issuing the tax? Because if it's a state tax, I want to talk to my state politicians. So I want to know who is requiring you by the force of law to charge me $7 for a fee. And they go, oh, it's, it's not a tax. You just said it was a tax. Uh, It's a fee. Is it a fee or is it a tax? It's a fee that Comcast charges everybody. Well, I don't want it on my bill. Well, it's going to be on your bill. It has to be on your bill because Comcast says so. Right. So you guys can just arbitrarily charge a freaking fee because you want to? And I said, can I charge you a $20 service fee for hassling me and and, uh, making me go through this crap? And they said, well, we notified you there'd be fees. And I go, okay, fair enough. How about if I notify you that starting next month, there's a $20 annoyance fee that I'm going to charge you? Oh, Mr. Ferguson, you, you can't do that. And I go, well, you're very easy to disregard the fact that I can't do it, but you're allowed to do it? Yes, that's right. And so I came up with another example. I said, you go to Walmart. You ever been to Walmart? And the lady, of course, she says, yes, I've been to Walmart. You go to the shelf and it says $9.99. And you go up to the cashier and it's $9.99 plus a $5 cashier cashier fee. And she goes, well, I expect to pay more than $9.99 because of taxes. And I go, okay, let me rephrase my question. You pay $9.99 plus the taxes, which are required by federal, state, or local agencies. And then Walmart charges you a $5 cashier fee. Are you going to pay it? And she goes, no, I, I wouldn't pay it. I would go to another store. And I go, well, wait, so, so you think it's okay that they just make this $5 fee? She says, yeah, corporations can do that. They can just charge fees and you can decide not to go there. You could go to Target. And I said, like, oh, great. Well, please let me know what is the other uh, government protected monopoly that provides high speed internet and cable TV services in my area? Well, no one provides the services that we do. That's true, isn't it? No one provides. And it's not because they don't want to. It's because you're a fucking monopoly. You're a regulated monopoly, but you're not being regulated. You charge me a $7 fee and a $5 fee that I never agreed to, that you never disclosed. And they told me, well, we did tell you there would be fees. 
yeah, I didn't think you'd make up random fucking fees. And I said, what if the fee next dollars is next month is not seven dollars? It's twenty dollars. And she says, well, you could could just cancel your uh, your cable service. I could just cancel my cable service. Well, that's great. What if I want cable service? Well, then you pay the twenty dollar fee. They did suggest that I could get rid of the regional sports fee if I went down to basic cable, which would give me like 15 channels, which is actually what I had in Champagne. And I said, well, let's discuss that because I don't need these other channels. And they said, that'd be forty nine ninety nine a month. And I go, well, that's a whole lot less than I'm paying now because I'm paying you guys almost 100 bucks now. And I said, so it's forty nine ninety nine plus the high speed internet. And she goes, well, the internet speed would be three. And I said, three, three what? Three doesn't tell me three. She goes, three uh, megabytes per second. And I said, do you really mean three megabytes or do you mean three megabits? And she thought about it for, she goes, three megabits. And I said, well, it's different, right? Because one is eight times faster than the other one. So why is it every time I talk to Comcast, I get information that when I question them on it, it's wrong or it's different. And so now I am compelled to, when I thought I was starting at $66 a month, here's my bill right here. I now have a hundred dollar a month bill. I agreed to 66 and through nickel and diming and changing the rules and not giving me what I was promised, I'm paying a hundred. Now it's not that I can't afford seven or $5. Thankfully for me. Now there's some people, this makes a big deal too. For me, it's the fucking principle. I mean, in my business, when I tell you you're going to pay X, you fucking pay X. I, and if someone caught me doing something else, I expect them to call me out on it. It's freaking bullshit. Don't quote some law to me. Uh, one of the uh, managers I talked to at Comcast quoted me. That, that first, they said that they're uh, regulated by the FCC, and it's an FCC tax. And I said, so there's an FCC law that you have to charge us? She goes, no, I we're regulated by the FCC. Well, of course you're regulated by the FCC. You're a communications company. What what does that mean? You, you're throwing out these words to, to back up, but when we investigate it, it doesn't support it. And then she finally said, there's an actual law I can send you. And I go, oh, okay. Well, you know, God, if I'm wrong, <laughs> I'm a skeptic, right? If I'm wrong and you're compelled by the force of law to charge me seven fucking dollars every month, send me the law. And she says, oh, uh, I can't send you this as protected document. I can't, it's a Comcast document. I can't send it to you. And I go, well, if it's a law, it's public information, right? You, you should be able to tell me, you, you say it's a law. No, it's not a law. You say it's a tax. No, I didn't say it's a tax. Oh, okay. Well, what document do you have that you were going to send me that you now can't send me? You, you can't support what you're saying. And she eventually reads something to me because she agreed to read it to me. And what it basically said, there is actually a law that someone felt was necessary to compel Comcast and other cable providers to not charge me a random broadcast TV fee if I don't have cable TV. I said, well, wait a minute. So if I don't get a cable TV service from you at all, the law says you can't just randomly charge me for a fee on top of a service I don't even get. She goes, yes, sir. That's law. I go, holy crap. Someone had to make a law to tell you not to charge me an extra fee on a service I'm not even paying for. Is that really necessary? (laughs) Apparently it was. I said, Where's the law that says you have to charge me $7 plus another five freaking dollars, $12 that I didn't agree to or know about in advance. And they finally acknowledged there is no law. And the only way for me to avoid the fees that they charge everybody is to not use Comcast. Well, I'm open to it folks. So if you have some way that I can get 75 or even 30 mega bits per second, and a whole bunch of channels that come conveniently to my house, send me an email. Let me know. Now, unfortunately for my business, I want something kind of high speed. So I don't want to dial up. I don't want to DSL unless I'm missing something. And last time I checked, DirecTV or Dish, it's so expensive to get internet, it's going to be more than this. So it's all simply just unbelievable. Oh, they did say I could avoid the sports fee. Like I said, if I went to basic cable... But basic cable and high-speed internet would actually cost me more than I'm paying now with the fees. So you're trapped in a box. And they've got you by the nuts, and they're squeezing, and no one's doing anything about it. This, this should be illegal. There should be a class-action lawsuit, and I'm looking into it. I found that 
there was some discussion on a website. I'm going to see if I can join it because this is wrong. When a company tells me they're going to charge me X amount per month, they shouldn't be able to add on arbitrary random supplemental fees that are subject to change at their whim. They agreed that it could be $20 next month and there'd be nothing I could do about it. Well, apparently, like with a cell phone, if I cancel this service before a year or two years is up, I'm going to have to pay a penalty for leaving. So I'm trapped. They're not trapped. They get to charge me whatever. So anywho, that's my freaking rant about Comcast. Forgive me. And we'll now return you to your regular programming. I've always been an atheist. I simply, as time went on, I became more interested in American intellectual history, and I felt that the secular side of our history was very much underrepresented in readable, popular history books. So that's how I got into it. I am not an atheist propagandist in that I'm not interested in converting people to atheism. What I'm interested in is talking about what the secular side of our history has meant to the development of the United States. And what has the secular side of the development uh, of our history meant for the development of the United States? Well, it's something that's not talked about much because we've got all these people going blah, blah, blah about how this was founded as a Christian nation. But it wasn't founded as a Christian nation, although we were overwhelmingly a majority Christian people at the time the Constitution was written. But what did the founders do in the Constitution? They made a break with all previous documents, including the state constitutions at the time after the revolution, and they didn't mention God. They didn't say that governmental power flows from God. They said, we the people. The word God does not appear in the Constitution at all, which always astonishes my college audiences when I tell them that, which tells you how badly American history is taught. In fact, what's generally taught about the origins of the United States is everybody who came here came here for religious liberty, which is true. But initially, before we became the United States and were colonial America, the people who came here for religious liberty came here for religious liberty for themselves, not for anybody else. So the first thing the Puritans did in Massachusetts was try to get rid of everybody who didn't agree with them. However, the founders had a very different view, which is because there were already people of so many different faiths here, we needed to have no state faith. So they just left it out altogether of the Constitution. The First Amendment was made specifically to protect religion from government. The Constitution itself, which leaves God out, was meant to protect government from religion. The two go together. All right, everybody, welcome back. This is Phil Ferguson, and of course, you are still listening to the cleverly titled Phil Ferguson Show. I have Neil and Kim with me today, and they are both with Camp Quest. How are you guys doing? Oh, it's a beautiful day in Southern California here. Well, that's nice. I, I am a, I'm getting extreme heat in the Midwest today. I think it's 78. We may have very similar weather today. Kimberly, how are you? Can you hear us? Yeah, loud and clear. All's well here in sunny Virginia. Well, that is fantastic. You're closer to the uh, the halls of power over there in Washington, D.C., I take it. Yes. Let's see. We're about two hours southwest. And both of you are involved with this crazy thing called Camp Quest. Why don't you tell me and, and more importantly, the listeners a little bit about it? Well, I am our executive director and I coordinate our national efforts um, to operate our Camp Quest locations uh, across the U.S. So we've got 13 affiliate camps uh, operating in 15 states, and I'm the head of our network. How do you have 13 camps within 15 states? Yeah, we've got 13 affiliates, and um, they're operating across 15 different states. So some of our camps are operating in more than one state. So, So they try to bring in students from more than one state? Uh, definitely. They also, they're running multiple camp locations. I understand. So yeah. like, yeah, give me one of them specifically that's in multiple locations. 
Uh, right. So our affiliate Camp Quest Southeast operates in South Carolina and also is opening a new camp location in Natchez Trace, Mississippi this year. And where can someone find all these camps? Just Google or is there a homepage? Uh, absolutely. We've got campquest.org and a whole list of our camps there as well as our locations. Okay. And, and uh, Neil, what do you do with Camp Quest? I'm on the board of directors of the national organization. I'm also one of the camp directors. And so uh, out here in Southern California, I'm the camp director coming up. Uh, I do have to say, just because we're mentioning the new camps, it's actually 20 different sessions this year. And uh, with the help of Dogma Debate and the broadcast-a-thon this last year, um, the Idaho location that's coming out, um, you know, these are kind of, as a direct result, some of that funding is going towards these new camps as well. So have to take the opportunity when we have those new camps down in Mississippi and Idaho to Thank the people over at Dogma Debate as well to putting together that broadcast-a-thon and helping some of those funds going to kind of uh, get these going and more camps in the future. Well, sorry, Neil, that's Iowa. Iowa, the other oh, Iowa. State. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's okay. It's, it's, yeah, they, they won't like me if I do that. But, I, yeah, Iowa, I'm very apologetic. Yeah, it, Camp it, Quest North up there doing good things. It's but Idaho, in... we want to be in you. So. <laughs> yeah, it's one of those I states. It's flyover America, um, but uh... – Iowa. We're talking about Iowa and Mississippi, two states which I I think could uh, greatly use a Camp Quest. This year uh, is the first year both of them have it, so hopefully they're getting some good registration numbers. I know uh, there's still a number of camps while uh, Oklahoma's going this week, so if you're in Oklahoma, it's a little bit too late. Uh, Some camps still have some openings for the summer. We go all the way until August, depending on the location, Uh, and a lot of camps are still looking for some volunteers for staff. Uh, Northern California is, Texas is looking for volunteers still, Ohio is looking for volunteers, Um, South Carolina, I believe, is looking for a few people as well. So if you're in those areas, check out campquest.org, find your local camp. They still may uh, may need you for help this summer. So campquest.org, you can go and find all the camps. You can go find the camps maybe to send your kids and or volunteer, depending on what your situation is. And I'm I'm assuming... The volunteers will have to go through some kind of background check? Background check, training, that does vary a little bit state to state. Um, but yes, you have to be eligible to work with children and willing to do the training involved. Now, I know that you mentioned Dogma Debate uh, and got funds from that. Uh, how did that happen? Tell me more about that. Sure, that was the broadcast-a-thon this last December. Uh, and so they did a number of things. As part of the funds that they were raising uh, in that 24-hour broadcast was to start new camp locations. And so we're starting to see some of those funds go out. Uh, As we were mentioning earlier, that's going to help new camp locations going into the future as well. Some of that was uh, spent directly on a camper ship uh, for each camp uh, location as well. So someone is going to each camp location um, paid for because of document debate. There is a national leadership summit that we're doing here uh, upcoming where all the camps come together. That got funding from that document debate uh, so I believe the final number was up uh, towards $65,000 raised in that 24-hour broadcast-a-thon. Uh, and it's going to be doing a lot of good, uh, both this year and going forward to the network itself. All of our camps are uh, residential sleepaway camps. So you get your traditional sleepaway camp experience for usually a whole week. And all of our camps um, offer traditional camp activities, like um, some offer swimming and arts and crafts, um, they do science projects, a lot of STEM-focused activities, hiking, some offer horseback riding or canoeing, um, it, as well as the added bonus experience of being at camp with other secular um, and free-thinking kids. Some parents might be concerned that if they send their kid there, they're going to get converted to atheism. What do you guys think or know about that? Well, we're, we're certainly not reaching into the public schools and, and scooping children up. Uh, families definitely have to send their kid to Camp Quest. Now, in general, or I'd say at all of our camps, we're providing uh, critical thinking tools, uh, but we're not, we're not an atheist camp, so to speak. We, we do serve kids of secular families and of atheist families. Um, but, you know, a lot of kids or a lot of families are mixed. You might have one religious parent, one non-religious parent. Uh, those non-religious parents shouldn't be afraid to send those kids to Camp Quest. Or I'm sorry, the religious parents shouldn't be afraid to. Um, But we do go through and, you know, different activities will vary depending on the camps and the years. But uh, there is some critical thinking. Um, You know, you're looking, if you made the Ten Commandments, what would you make? There's some thought experiments. There's some philosophy that they're doing. 
Um, but most of all, it's just camp. So if they're looking for that camp experience without having to go to a church camp or Bible camp uh, or without even some of the things of the Boy Scouts, it's definitely a place uh, at Camp Quest. I think, too, sort of most importantly that um, we don't ascribe any labels to the campers that are coming. So even though they might be coming from uh, an atheist family or a theist family, um, it's really uh, up to the camper as to how they identify. Um, And some of them do come with um, identifying with the way that their parents believe, and some of them don't. Um, So we really try and honor uh, the camper's experience. So I think it would be fair to say, and I have had both of my kids went to Camp Quest at least once, it's all the fun you want in a summer camp and no indoctrination, and you throw in a little bit of critical thinking skills, and the kids just get to be kids, and they get to ask questions that kids love to ask, and they have a whole lot of fun. Absolutely. And I'm always surprised at how much uh, year-long friendships are built up at camp. You know, a lot of these kids, I said, you don't necessarily have to uh, be an atheist. There's no labels going on. But whatever they believe or or don't believe, they're oftentimes the only ones at school and things like that. And so uh, Camp Quest, having a place where these kids can have that discussion or just have friends where the topic isn't what, you know, church do you go to, uh, really helps build up community and really gives a lot of those kids something to look forward to every year. Now, if my listeners like the idea of this, and I'm hoping a lot of them do, how do they give money? Because some of my listeners have some dough. How do they give money? So you are very welcome to visit campquest.org and to donate online to us. Uh, we make that pretty easy and, and painless through our website. Uh, you're also welcome to send a check in the mail. Our mailing address is Camp Quest. P.O. Box 341, Stanton, Virginia. That's S-T-A-U-N-T-O-N, Virginia, 24402. Great. Well, Kim and Neil, is there anything that we didn't cover you want to add in? Again, depending on your location, there may still be time this year to uh, sign up your child. That'd be at campquest.org to find your local camp. Like I said, they're starting literally this week is already going with Oklahoma, but stretch all the way until the middle of August. Uh, And if you're in one of those states or willing to travel to Texas, Ohio, Uh, Northern California, uh, South Carolina, all those camps and possibly others are still looking for volunteers. So again, campquest.org, you can give money there. It's the best place to find all the great information. 20 camps in 15 states this year. Uh, It's really going to be quite a summer. Thanks so much for having us on the show, Phil. All right. Well, thank you both for your time. Phil, have a wonderful day. I don't want to be a, an emperor. That's not my business. I don't want to rule or conquer anyone. I should like to help everyone if possible. Jew, Gentile, black man, white. We all want to help one another. Human beings are like that. We want to live by each other's happiness, not by each other's misery. We don't want to hate and despise one another. In this world, there's room for everyone, and the good earth is rich and can provide for everyone. The way of life can be free and beautiful, but we have lost the way. Greed has poisoned men's souls, has barricaded the world with hate, has goose-stepped us into misery and bloodshed. We have developed speed, but we have shut ourselves in. Machinery that gives abundance has left us in want. Our knowledge has made us cynical, our cleverness hard and unkind. We think too much and feel too little. More than machinery, we need humanity. More than cleverness, we need kindness and gentleness. Without these qualities, life will be violent and all will be lost. The aeroplane and the radio have brought us closer together. The very nature of these inventions cries out for the goodness in men, cries out for universal brotherhood, for the unity of us all. Even now, my voice is reaching millions throughout the world, millions of despairing men, women, and little children, victims of a system that makes men torture and imprison innocent people. To those who can hear me, I say, do not despair. The misery that is now upon us is but the passing of greed, The bitterness of men who fear the way of human progress. The hate of men will pass and dictators die. And the power they took from the people will return to the people. And so long as men die, liberty will never perish. Soldiers, don't give yourselves to brutes. Men who despise you, enslave you, who regiment your lives, tell you what to do, what to think and what to feel, who drill you, diet you, treat you like cattle, use you as cannon fodder. 
Don't give yourselves to these unnatural men, machine men with machine minds and machine hearts. You are not machines. You are not cattle. You are men. You have the love of humanity in your hearts. You don't hate. Only the unloved hate. The unloved and the unnatural. Soldiers, don't fight for slavery. Fight for liberty. In the 17th chapter of St. Luke, it is written, the kingdom of God is within man. Not one man, nor a group of men. But in all men, in you, you, the people, have the power. The power to create machines. The power to create happiness. You, the people, have the power to make this life free and beautiful. To make this life a wonderful adventure. Then in the name of democracy, let us use that power. Let us all unite. Let us fight for a new world. A decent world that will give men a chance to work, that will give youth a future and old age a security. By the promise of these things, brutes have risen to power, but they lie. They do not fulfill that promise. They never will. Dictators free themselves, but they enslave the people. Now let us fight to fulfill that promise. Let us fight to free the world, to do away with national barriers, to do away with greed, with hate and intolerance. Let us fight for a world of reason. A world where science and progress will lead to all men's happiness. Soldiers, in the name of democracy, let us all unite! All right, everybody, welcome back. This is Phil Ferguson, and you are still listening to the Phil Ferguson show with me today have a, a good friend and a long time skeptic activist kind of person Aaron Ra how are you sir I'm doing well uh, all things considered um, I'm, I'm about to get into a fray that'll probably whoop my ass and it'll be doing something that I have no idea what I'm doing but I'm going to try it anyway <laughs> well so, sometimes in life that's that's good yeah, well, I am definitely out of my element, uh, and it, it's a funny thing. I mean, here lately, since I announced that I was going to be in, that I was running for Texas State Senate, I had a lot of viewers complain that you know I mentioned politics in my in my videos instead of just science. Well, I'm How sorry, some you. of my some of my videos are about politics, and they kind of have to be for the rest of this election. And uh, it, it, it's I want to I want to be responsible. I want to I want to follow Bernie's lead and a number of other people that inspired me to 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 run, and and this is something that's overdue because when I first became an activist, I think I might have told you once upon a time uh, about twenty years ago, when I first became an activist, it was because uh, some evangelicals were bragging to me about how their church had uh, gotten everybody to vote exactly the way the minister told them to, you know, despite what provisions existed then to prohibit such things. And they had, they were bragging about how they had positioned certain uh, judges or legislators or senators or whatever. And it, it was a, the purpose of it then was described to me that they wanted to take over the entire Government, literally, uh, right. by grassroots, replacing every person, every elected official with a evangelical believer. And they've come very close to a full immersion in that. And I mean, especially if you live in Texas, I mean, every level of government is is occupied by right wing Christian dominionists. It's nuts. Well, and of course, uh, on the day that we're recording this, and I don't normally do this, but I think it's going to be important for the listeners, you and I are recording on June 1st, and the show will probably be live you know, within a week of that recording date. But uh, just today, Donald Trump uh, announced that the United States will be leaving the Paris Accord on climate change uh, yep. because it's a hoax and it's a scam and no one's looking out for America. And uh, I, uh, you know... That and some other crap that I see in politics and stuff. I, I'm almost on the verge of being despondent today. I mean, it's just unfucking believable that we are um, kind of in this place. It's yeah. The only faith that I have left in humanity is that Elon Musk, uh, one of the most progressive people on earth, uh, made good on his promise to walk out on the president. I, when I he was did that. I was delighted that he honored that. I, I'm. I'm torn about the fact that he stayed so long. I, I, I think he wanted to try to yeah. reason with the unreasonable. I, 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 I mean, I, if I Trump it. hired him to be an advisor, I, I mean, he picked a good guy. Yeah. 
It's just that he's that's the only good guy Trump picked. Yeah, he's a he's a visionary, so he had a vision that he could make people listen and And uh, I had to wonder why it was that he would why would Trump hire Elon Musk as an advisor and I realized it was not because of uh, of of Musk's progressive actions and all the things that that man has done to better the world. No. Trump hired him because he was rich. Yeah. Yeah, he's, he's because he was an entrepreneur who owned multiple, you know, mega million dollar companies. But Elon Musk is in a different category. I mean, I, I so much wanted to when I was president of Atheist Alliance of America, I wanted so bad to to bestow the award. You know, we have to choose who who we're going to give the the Dawkins Award right. to every year. But it needed to be an outstanding atheist or an outspoken atheist who uh, was doing something to uh, on on the behalf of science and um, reason. Uh, and and so, what what better choice, right? Then Elon Musk, who created the the, you know, the 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 better technology on electric cars, so that suddenly electric cars are more powerful and more badass than the muscle cars that I grew up with. Electric cars, really? Yeah. Do you remember when we were in high school? Electric cars were something that could go fifty miles an hour for one hour, and they and and that was only if they weighed fifty pounds. You know, yeah. and and the, the muscle cars at that time were 400 horses. That was a big deal, 400 horsepower. Well, now we have electric cars where they're taking the old 66 Mustang and putting electric motors into it. So now we have an, a, a 66 <laughs> Mustang that has dual electric 800 horsepower. That's the new thing. Yeah, that, that would be nice. I, I do know, uh, I don't know if you knew this, but I have a new 2017 Toyota Prius Prime, which means it can charge in, plug in and charge for and get up to 25, 30 miles. I got 32 the other day on electric. Um, and, you know, it's not a powerful car, but when it's in electric only mode, it is so incredibly smooth. It's like floating on air because there's no engine shaking the car. There's no feeling of shifting between gears. It just goes and it's the most amazing thing to me it's like switching from a hard disk drive uh to a um, solid disk uh yeah solid state drive in your computer it, it's let me make a suggestion I mean, this is something that i've been wanting to do and and, and ho- hopefully somebody with a, with a bunch of money can back this idea i i de- i designed this uh off-road truck that was a, a super versatile truck. I don't like the way that we that we build things because we don't build things to to be able to do everything we need them to do so I, I devised a truck that could be everything for everybody. They, you know, fold down seats, things that zip up, zip down, unbutton, defasten, fold over, and become something else. It's a it's a car that's almost a transformer in all the different I things. I was just thinking be. transformer. Yeah, well, it, it, it just and it's uh, it, it looks like like uh, it looks like one of the warthogs from. Uh, from from Halo, you know the the off road vehicle from the Halo games. Sure. It looks a lot like that. So it is very tough, very butch, very badass. But that depends on the configuration. You can also turn it into an SU, a nine passenger SUV if you want to. And and but anyway, that the purpose of this thing, what I was talking about, is if we had this vehicle, then such a vehicle as as we know, we'd get something like two or three miles a gallon if it was running on internal combustion engines. But what if? We put a couple of these 400 horsepower electric motors in this thing, and we we put it in this. Not a super high tech car like like anything Tesla makes now, right? No, let's put it in an off road road warrior type vehicle, and we give it to to Joe Bob and Cletus living out in some single wide trailer somewhere, and we they have their solar panels, they have their wind generators, they can they can charge this thing up for free. And instead of paying that ridiculous gas price that they would have to pay on a four wheel drive, now they've got something that goes, you know, that has this ridiculous range, like a three hundred mile range, and you just charge it up for free, and you have instant torque. Now think about this from the terms of somebody that's going to be driving an off road vehicle: instant torque with two four hundred horsepower motors and actual all wheel drive. That's outstanding, right? You give this, you give this vehicle to these two guys, a couple of rednecks somewhere, and then you get them to give you a report on how much they like that truck when it's all over and done. Free power, and I mean free power, wind and solar. That's how they charge this thing. Free power, 
for all that horsepower and instant torque, yeah, they would never go back to internal combustion <laughs> engines again. Yeah. And, 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 <laughs> that and would the, be brilliant. And since we're talking about topical things, I mean, one of the things, one of my platform things is that so many of our problems, the solution to so many of the problems that we have in this country is that we need to do the exact opposite of everything the GOP is trying to do. I agree. Just just like across the board, everything. And one of those examples was something I saw today about Colorado since they legalized marijuana. And a lot of people may look at me and think that, you know, they, they may mix up my motives. I do not I do not smoke marijuana. I don't. I just I don't enjoy it. I'm one of those weird freaks where, yeah, I tried it and I, it was not for me and I don't do it. It, it, it. it could be legal everywhere and I still wouldn't be doing it. So that's not where I'm coming from. But the data is in. In all the places where marijuana has been legalized and where they've gotten revenue from it, they've been there've been a boon. For example, in Oregon, uh, they they had so much of a surplus that they had a tax-free day for their citizens just to celebrate. And in in Colorado, they made over a hundred million dollars in revenue. And their governor just signed over to to send that money to uh, to help addictions, uh, you know, addiction clinics, and also to in, increase uh, education and a half a dozen different other programs. You got a hundred million dollars. There's an awful lot you can do with that. And and Colorado is not even close to our most populous state. So exactly. Uh, it, and, if, and if they got and I, I, I lived in Colorado, there's not a hell of a lot of people there. But, there, you know, there's a lot of wilderness, be, beautiful place. But it, it's, it's like if we were to legalize marijuana with these kind of uh, provisions, you know, where you're getting the, 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 the state revenue and you've got state regulations and everything on it, then what happens to the drug cartels when there's suddenly no market? for them anymore oh yeah you, well, what? in this case it's rare you want to build happens. a wall to solve this problem or have we already <laughs> solved the problem instead of coming up with you know with with all the billions of dollars that you're going to have to cut everybody's medicaid and their and and their their social security and their disability benefits and every other thing if you want to completely deprive the united states if you want to completely deprive americans of their quality of life then what's the purpose of the wall yeah and and the wall would no longer be keeping people out; it'd be keeping people in. Well, because who the hell wants to live in a country like this? When 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 Trump says he's going to make America great again, he's making America a third world country he and is. destroying everything that made this place have value. Now, what what exactly are you running for? I know you're running, and I've seen it, and I could Google it, but some of my listeners might not know. <laughs> yeah, I'm running for Texas State Senate. Okay, and uh, and uh, unfortunately, I cannot. There's not a lot of people that will hear this podcast that will be able to vote for me because it it has to be in one of the nine counties in my district. Ah, and that includes Far East Dallas, and that's not even including Dallas itself. Now, it's do you a, have a, a published little... platform somewhere? I have a website, uh, rnraw.org, dot org. That's a r o n r a dot org. Uh, that that talks a little bit about what I'm doing, and I'm. I'm since I got back from uh, the the Europe trip, I'm going to be ramping up my campaign here real soon. I had some deadlines to meet and everything, but I'm I'm about to kick it in in gear now and begin a speaking tour of these different counties. And I'm going to be trying to get as much publicity as I can. I don't. I am not going to go the regular route of the way politicians do. I'm, I'm clearly I'm not an average politician. Anybody that takes a glance at me will know that I'm up, you know, obviously not a I'm an atypical candidate this is going to be an atypical campaign I don't uh, I don't I don't let me let me put it this way Democrats or sitting Democrats have told me that in order to secure this position that I would need to raise maybe a half a million dollars they want me to raise a half million dollars to secure a job that is effectively a part-time job that only pays 21000 a year. That, to me, is crazy. That does sound pretty messed up. And this is part of the problem I have with money in politics. This, it, this shouldn't be this way. Well, now, I'm, I'm hoping. I was going to say, now, it, it shouldn't be this way, but yeah. in reality today it is. So while many of my listeners will not be in your area— Maybe some of them have some money and would like to uh, help you kick some ass. Uh, where <laughs> where can they donate? Well, yeah, there's a there's a couple of things. My my 
my primary interest is uh, is my activism. You can support my activism through patreon.com forward slash A-R-O-N-R-A. And that's honestly, that's going to be the, the first and foremost priority for me. But you can also support my candidacy on rnrod.org. And yeah, those just, are two separate things. And I wanted something else I want to clarify. Yeah. It, it, it's, it, it's another strange thing that uh, American politics, or at least the politics in this area, are so corrupt that there is no limit to the amount of money that any individual or PAC or company can donate to a Texas state Senate campaign. Ah. That's – that's crazy to me. Now, while I'm while I'm expecting that I'm certainly not going to do the standard route on this. I mean, there is going to be a, a, a whole bunch of money required. I I, I would never even figure out how to use a half a million dollars because I'm not going to do the same thing that everybody does. But if I can raise a few thousand, there are a number of fees and other things that I have to pay just to be just to be able to be in the game. Yeah. You know, this, that, that's how ridiculous this is. I mean, so they were, they were saying that the minimum that I would have to raise is 30000 which, again, is more than I would make at the job. That is truly, ama- the job. truly amazing. But here, here's something uh, I'm going to have on the, the next few oh, weeks. I have to say one other thing. Yeah. I can, I, I can accept an unlimited amount of money, but only from American citizens. Ah, so right. if you're listening from a foreign country, please don't, because I don't want to have to go filter through the donations <laughs> to try to figure out which. Right. But, you know, but they could donate. They could donate else. via Patreon. Because I will have to give that back. Yeah, if they're in Patreon, they can they can support you from anywhere. Patreon, you can support me from anywhere. That's correct. So and that and I, I want to specify that supports my activism. Which, you know, there's a way you can look at that as it being that I am a political activist. Yeah, okay, but but you know, you wouldn't be supporting my campaign necessarily if you're supporting me through through Patreon. But of course, I'm I'm. I'm that's the best way to support me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've just recently moved and, you know, went through a lot of expenses and I'm getting settled in. So in the next few weeks and, and your segment, of course, in, in part has something to do with this. I'm, I'm going to raise some money for um, Camp Quest and maybe some other organizations that I've got lined up. But what I'm going to do, Arn, is, is I want my listeners seriously to seriously consider, I mean, even pausing this episode before, and and then shortly we're going to talk about the Bible. We're going to have real fun and rip, yeah. rip it apart, right? If you like that kind of stuff, if you like uh, stuff that yeah. Aaron has already said or has said somewhere else, or you like his videos, okay, fine, you can support him at Patreon. But I think we should step up and find him some money for his campaign. And so I often do a match. And so what I'm going to do this time, I'm not going to do a match. I'm going to start. Aaron, so I am going to donate one thousand dollars to your campaign. Outstanding. And I'm going to call on other listeners to understand we need to make a stand and we need to show people that they can actually, in our community, raise some fucking money. Now, would we like money out of politics? No shit, right? Yeah. But unfortunately, while everyone else is playing the game of collecting big corporate sponsors and donors. We just keep pissing into the wind. So uh, I'm going to send you a check for $1,000 for your campaign. I'm going to ask the listeners to give it serious consideration. Go check out Arn Ra. You probably already, if you listen to my show, you probably know him. He's way, way more important and been doing this longer than I have. But let's start that ball rolling. And you can comment on that or we can just kind of segue into uh, your book if you want. I will, I will follow your lead, sir. Oh, I just want to throw out one more thing about the campaign because some people yeah. have asked about uh, whether I, I have a, any alliance with uh, uh, Justice Democrats and, and the Our Revolution. And, and yes, I identify as a Bernie Crat. That he was primarily the person who inspired me. And, and more than him, actually, was I was inspired by someone who was inspired by him. That would be uh, Steve Hill. Uh, yes. Ran for for uh, California State Senate, and I and I thought that was a brilliant move, and and I wanted to follow it. So that's what I'm doing. So I'm I'm about uh, you know representing the people, and uh, I'm all for the free college, the single payer Medicare for all, re-regulating Wall Street, ending the drug war, as we were just talking about, and doing it in a sensible way. I also think we can do sensible. Um, uh, uh, um, what is the word? Uh, immigration. Right. You know, because, well, we we don't need to get into that. You want to get into the Bible, we'll do that. Well, well plenty of I think there's plenty the of things, stuff. and, you know, not all of my listeners agree with me politically. I even got an email recently with someone that loves my financial stuff but agrees 
disagrees with almost everything else I say, and that's cool. That's fine. That person's not going to donate to you. But the vast majority of my <laughs> listeners, I mean, these are these are sweet spots for me. I mean, almost everything you've said, I, I actually I can't think of something I disagree with yet. I'm sure there's something, but um, we need to put our money forward and do that. But uh, the book, I mean, we talked about it when you were on the show last year, but let's just remind the listeners what was the book that you had recently. Oh, the, my book is uh, The Foundational Falsehoods of Creationism, uh, and it's available on Amazon both as a – as a as a it's a 440 page uh fairly large paperback uh, or it's available also in audio and uh, it it's doing surprisingly well for a first time book i think every time i check it it's in the top 50,000 out of 8 million which i think is a pretty good rating sounds great to me yeah so as long as the longer it can stay there and it's managed to stay there since uh, since about October. November, October, November when it came out. So it's it's held pretty well. Well, I I, I do know that I like I often do with most books, I had the audiobook version so someone could read it to me while I was busy driving or something because I normally just do not have time to sit down and read a book. And I I'm, I'm assuming because of your experience giving presentations in person and through video and that has honed your skills to the point that it was the most enjoyable and, quite frankly, one of the very few books that I found myself fist-pumping in the car as you were <laughs> ripping apart the insanity of bullshit of our modern-day religion. Well, thank you very much for that. I, that, that's a, that's a, that is a shining endorsement. And I've, I've gotten a lot of, of really good endorsements, so I'm, I'm pleased. Uh, there was a couple of people that were obviously creationists <laughs> 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 that commented on my book. Uh, and one of them clear, very clearly hadn't read it. They actually wrote a review or something along the lines of, you know, well, if evolution is true, then why aren't there any transitional species? And uh, hadn't bothered to look at chapter nine, obviously, where I list a few hundred of them. Well, I'm just wondering if if, uh, if they do another printing of your book, uh, would it be able to be put in chapter and verse form so you could you could cite it for them? Maybe. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I, I use pieces of it all the time in online conversations, and then that's fun. But you know, it's it. I keep running into people that are in like all these conferences and everything. And so it's like somebody brings their Christian friend, you know, and then that that Christian friend says, "Well, I would believe in evolution, except that there's never been any beneficial mutations." And so I can just, you know, it, it, wow. whip out the book and I can show. Here's a list. Yeah, of beneficial just, mutations that are documented in peer-reviewed scientific literature. Now, it, what is your excuse? Because you know, we know that you're not going to just say, "Oh, I didn't know that," and I'm going to start believing. No. Yeah, I, I and, just, and it's not a matter of belief. This is another thing that I don't get. Why do these people <laughs> act like this? You know that that when when they use the word belief, and when I say they, I don't mean to do an, S, you know, an us versus they thing. But there is there is two modes of thought here. Uh, we have believers who identify as believers, and when they say belief, they mean something different than when I say belief. When I say I believe something. It means that uh, this is something that I think is true or closest to the truth or more most likely true, but I don't know it to be true. Uh, and what I believe is different than what I know. What I know, I can show. It's demonstrable. So I would never state this as fact. This is just, you know, this is what the hypothesis is or this is what the evidence indicates, something like that. Otherwise, if I know it, I will state it as, as fact and I will be able to demonstrate that it is fact. However, as Peter Bogosian has pointed out, you know, faith is a matter of pretending to know what you really don't know. And it's a matter of just building up your confidence to assert things as 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 uh, definitely as you possibly can. So when they say believe, they mean make believe the power of pretend. That's literally what that means. They means that they pretend this. Yeah, it, it is truly staggering. And, and I've dealt with it for a very long time. And uh some people just don't have the patience, and usually I do. I, I just recently ran into somebody that I, I, don't, I don't know. It's just so demonstrably wrong and stupid and obvious. And uh, <laughs> thirty seconds of testing, they were a flat earther, and you know they just go, "There's no evidence for it." I'm like, you know, I, it, you just do a Google search, and and you can you can find time lapse videos from you know the space shuttle. <laughs> just to name many things that can show you the curvature of the earth. Um, 
But but then when you're talking to people like that, they say that everything that you ever show them, every kind of evidence, is faked. Yeah, because it, there's this massive, cohesive conspiracy of yeah. all the smartest people everywhere in the world for no reason at all to work together on this. Yet there's no leaks in this conspiracy at all, and every, and it's what what is it? Big globe? Yeah, I was just going to say big big round ball is with the... <laughs> no potential profit or anything. Yeah, it 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 is truly staggering, and you know, with religion, I guess. I could almost see it because if you get brought up in a religion and your parents are religious and your family is religious and your aunts and uncles and everyone around you tells you and you you start to get questions. I mean, for most people, there's exceptions to everything. When you get to the point where you go, hey, wait a minute, the guy in the red suit and the reindeer thing. And they go, (laughs) ah, you know, little Timmy, little Susie, congratulations, you figured it out. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, So you you got a chance. But when you get to that moment where you first question Christianity Everyone around you clutches their fucking pearls. By the way, you can swear on my show. Um, and they <laughs> gasp and tell you you're going to burn and it's going to be a living hell for you and blah, blah, blah. And you go, oh, well, gosh, let me reconsider it again. And, and you get pushed back into the bottle. That I can see. Flat Earth? Are you fucking kidding me? No. Yeah. And I don't believe that any of these Flat Earth people at all. I mean, to tell, tell you why. I mean, I can get... I can get you know some random believer on my podcast, or we're not not on my podcast because I'm not about that. But I do, I do sometimes interview people just to just to have them on on video and and you know get a real time conversation out of people and see if I can reason with the unreasonable. But I can't get flat earthers to do that with me. They will not. You can have you can have written conversations because they have to be very careful what they say, and they know that. Yeah. Well, so the flat yeah. earth thing is just a big it, it's a, it's a game. Well, this this there's is a no person who, who there. I mean, you have a handful of crazy people at most. Yeah. But otherwise it's it's a big punk game. Yeah. There is no flat earth. This is someone who just not sincere one. doesn't have the intellectual capacity to work their way out of a paper bag and so they don't have any arguments or counter arguments. They're just like I I think it's flat. I mean just look around and that that's really all they had and and they just are a mental midget. <laughs> Um, but anyway, well, yeah, let me, let me just share this. I mean, I've having, having done a bit of travel, you know, I've noticed little things like, you know, when you're, when you cross the Atlantic, for example, it takes less time to fly from West to East than it does from what, from East to West, you know, and there's, there's also certain peculiarities when you get up to, uh, uh, certain latitudes, like when you're you know, in Iceland, for example, the sun is definitely in a different position than it is when you're in the tropics. Well, I, I was going to so say, man, in fact, you can do that. You know, it within the continental United States, uh, you know, you don't even have to go all the way down to Key West or anything, but you, you can go from Gulf Coast or, or uh, Mid Atlantic or Texas where you are and drive for a day or two straight north. I mean, you don't even have to leave the United States. You can go to Fargo. Uh, you can go see uh, Mount Rushmore. You can go up to Green Bay, Wisconsin, or the UP. And the time the sun sets is dramatically different. <laughs> and <laughs> and if the whole thing is flat, what, what causes that? It's just the excuse they have then oh, is that the sun is a, is a tiny little thing that's like... 30,000 feet above the ground or something along the way. It's, it's some ridiculous story like that. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, that's, that's the way they, they rationalize it. But it doesn't account for anything yeah. or it doesn't account for everything. And then that, that, I would want to open the conversation by throwing out a few things just to see what they accept that will shoot them in the foot and prevent them from being able to argue any further. Because ultimately what really collapses all of this is gravity. Yeah. It, it, they, have, they have no way to account for gravity. They actually have to maintain that the, the Earth is some kind of a weird plate that is accelerating at 1G <laughs> to up continuously to forever. Yeah. So yeah, how many times the speed of light are we doing now? <laughs> it, it, it's funny. I, I just moved from Champaign, Illinois, up to a uh, far southwest Chicago suburb of New Lenox, and I am genuinely – Surprised. I, I, maybe I should have figured it out. Champaign Urbana is so freaking liberal. It could be Boston or Seattle, you know, it, it, because of the University of Illinois and people from all over the world. And I thought, okay, I'm moving close to Chicago, but I'm so, I mean, I'm on the very edge of the Chicago suburbs, 40 miles from downtown. 
and there's the monster trucks with the six foot flags and uh you know a lot of things you would expect to see in america and religion <laughs> is actually more prevalent in this chicago suburb than it was in champaign urbana and i keep finding myself where i could openly mock religion in champaign urbana and no one would blink an eye because they all know it's ludicrous because they have educations generally a lot of education and now I come up with just average Americans. I mean, there's not anything particularly wrong with them, but I'll say something and I'll get shited for it. And I'm like, really? Are, are we still fucking believing this? I mean, are you freaking kidding me? And so let's. Well, here's the yeah. Here's the thing. This is the way people are conditioned, right? It's not just that it's all pretend. It's that it because it's so flimsy because it's a house of cards. You know, it requires a great many defenses. And so they're conditioned that any that that you are good if you believe that, and you are bad if you even question it. If you have any doubt, that's bad, and you could suffer a fate a threat of a fate worse than death if you doubt this. And you're supposed to react violently to anyone who dares question that belief, because if they question that belief, then they are satanic, and you are you are conditioned. To, for a violent response to anyone who challenges your make believe. Well, the the thing that I've been conditioned to uh, years ago, I lived it in uh, for two years in the state of Arkansas. You may have heard of it. And <laughs> the thing that the locals did there, and I expected that in the Bible Belt. I've not had this here yet. But when I was in Arkansas, people would ask your name, and then they ask what church you'd go to, and it it would always create a debate. And almost always, I'm up for that debate. But sometimes I wasn't. So I went through the Yellow Pages. They used to have these books for, for younger listeners that gave numbers and addresses of places in town. And I looked through it and I found, you know, the Church of Jesus on 123 Main Street. And so I would give them that answer to just short circuit the whole argument and, and not have to do it. And then, of course, people started going, that's the wrong church. <laughs> and, of course, you know, this would happen from time to time. And one, one day my wife and I are out and she's the calm, sane, level-headed one. I'm the reactionary radical. And we went through one of these things and someone asked, you know, first, what's your name? And then they asked what church I go to. And I lost my shit. And I'm just like, what the fuck is wrong with you? And they stare at me because this is not the response they're used to. And I go, why don't you ask me my wife's favorite sexual position? What the fuck are you doing asking deep and meaningful, significant personal questions about my belief system what makes you think that's a good fucking place to start and of course my wife is grabbing my arm you know down boy down boy you know and this person is just stammering and stuttering and it occurred to me if that happened to them two or three more times they would never ask that question again and and so this 2,000 years of holding our tongue shit has not worked so we need to fight back yeah, we need to be a lot less respectful about believing things that, that we know is not true. I mean, now think about it. I mean, people will say, well, you got to respect my beliefs. You know, oh, the Jesus. The hell I do. The yeah. hell I do. If you tell <laughs> me, you. and I've said this so many times, if you tell me that you think that, um, uh, what, what, what is it, uh, Franklin, uh, <laughs> Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin. If you tell me that Benjamin Franklin was the first king of America, and that's what you believe. I'm going to correct you. Yeah. I'm not going to respect your belief. I'm going to do you a favor by correcting you so that you don't embarrass yourself to other people. Now, if you want to deny reality, and that's what religion is, if you want to d- deny reality and tell me that you have a right to believe things that you know to be wrong, okay, fine. But I, I did try to do you right. the favor, and that's the way it should be taken. Well, I, I look at it, you know, I, I will try to respect a person at a level relevant to their behavior. So, I mean, if they're respectful and, and courteous to me, I'll be respectful to them as a person. But their ideas are a different matter, and I almost see it as I have a ethical, nay, a moral obligation to correct them because if they hold simply, obviously, truly ridiculous beliefs, it affects what they do and who they vote for, and it yep. fucks us all. So, you know, let me kind of segue into so what do you see wrong with the bible how's that for subtle <laughs> well you just yeah you, you just before i take your segue i mean you you've mentioned something that is actually pretty powerful and a lot of people don't understand they all they want to say well where do you get your morals from uh, yeah 
And this comes up all the time. I get my morals from the same place everybody else gets their morals. And the surprising thing is that religion cloaks that and and makes you think you get it from somewhere else. But what actually happens, and we've seen this proven by the Clergy Project, which is, of course, an organization that now has uh, hundreds of members that that were all former clergy, the people who find themselves in the pulpit in you know professional positions as pastors and stuff when they realize that uh, they don't they don't buy this themselves anymore and they don't have a way to get out well they they they've got a community at least that they can communicate with and that's the the, the clergy project but what we've discovered is that when people who were hardline evangelical fundamentalists and all of this for the longest time, when they finally get a crack in that armor of God and their mind is no longer closed like a steel trap, what ends up happening is they become more tolerant. Yeah. They become, they vote more liberally. You know, they, they suddenly, they lose the hate that they used to have. So, I mean, they're actually more moral by leaving religion. And there's a terrible statistic correlation between uh, various forms of immorality and criminality and so forth with the hardcore believers. I mean, it's like with, with child molestation and abuse, for example. Uh, you know, the studies have shown that the more religious you are, the more frequent and the more horrific the abuses will be. Well, and, you know, and, that's, and, and, and the that's people a pretty that are, profound statement, the, but it's it's actually been verified by studies yeah. and the people consistently who are deeply religious. Uh, they take it seriously, and then they end up taking action on their beliefs and doing something abhorrent, and the other believers say they're not a true Christian, where they're probably more Christian and more literal than you. I mean, and they had the conviction to follow their psychotic beliefs, but they only did that because they were convinced by your book that those were good things to do, like killing gay people or killing non-believers. I mean, uh, the Bible says you are supposed to do it remisslessly. You are, if you find a unbeliever, you should kill them without hesitation. Because if you hesitate, you are sinning. It's unbelievable. Yeah, and so somebody told me the other day, you know, that it was somebody that that uh, honors the Bible or uses the Bible as their guide. You know, would uh, would take this moral road of forgiveness and all. Of that. And I'm like, have you even looked <laughs> have you in read, the Bible? Have you because read that, that no, that is. <laughs> That's not at all what happens. I said, you know, somebody that uses the Bible as their guide is going to murder anybody who works on weekends. Yeah, or picks up Someone picks who uses sticks. the Bible as their moral guide will sell their daughter into slavery. Well, let's, or, let's, let's talk uh, about slavery for a minute. Doesn't the New Testament uh, say slavery is bad? Oh, no, it doesn't. I mean, because Jesus says that, you know, the, that the, uh, the servants must be... Uh, obedient to their masters. And then the next argument that comes up well, is that biblical slavery isn't like the slavery we had before the civil. Yeah, it is. It's every bit as bad. And in the in the commandments, and I don't mean 10 commandments, because if you look at Exodus 20, it does not stop at 10. It really doesn't. What everybody thinks is the 10 commandments. In Exodus 20, there are 11 commandments just right there, just in that one chapter. And then that list continues in Exodus 21, 22, 23, until Moses finally comes down with all the laws and all the edicts and all the commandments in you know this, this vast volume that he then chucks onto the ground to then have to go back and get the second edition. Because, you know, this, this and, is God's word. And, you know, and, if I can, and this causes Moses to break the commandments because they have to fit in somehow two different stories, two narratives, yeah. two sets of commandments. And the second set of commandments, which is in Exodus 34, is a completely different set except for the first two. It's only, and, and, and God says, well, I'll write this commandments again, and it'll be exactly what I wrote before, except that he gives a completely different list. And of course, the, and in this one, the fourth commandment is no longer honor your father or mother, or they will kill you, which is, by the way, what the first one says, honor your father or your mother, or they will kill you, because that's actually in there, that, uh, that, that you know, disobedient children were to be murdered, because death penalty is for everything. But in, in, in this case... The fourth commandment is that you have to sacrifice your firstborn sons on the altar to God. You may redeem them with a goat or a sheep or something like that if it's pure, but nobody comes to me empty-handed. And I believe it was Ezekiel that was lamenting that people were actually doing this, and they were actually killing their own children on this altar to God. My my favorite, of course, because that's that's a good one, but my favorite, just because it's whimsical, is number 10 is, Thou shalt not seethe a goat in its mother's milk. (laughs) 
Yeah, because that'd be creepy. <laughs> yeah, we, you know, we, we don't get anything about genocide or slavery. We get culinary instructions. Yeah, but you know what? In, in the first set of commandments, in the, in the Exodus 20 through 23, uh, you do get a lot about slavery and, and what people just, I mean, they think, okay, well, I got up to 10, and we'll just stop here in Exodus 20 and not read any further. No, read further, because it is racist, it is sexist, and when I say racist, I mean that, you know, they do have slaves, but Jewish slaves get the option to be released after seven years, Sometimes. unless you also own their wives and children, right. in which case they won't want to leave, and that's the loophole by which you can stab an all through their ear and own them forever. But otherwise, the Bible says that you can, you can abduct people, that you know, any foreigner that wanders through your land, you can take them as a slave, and you can keep them forever. And it also says in those glorious commandments that everybody wants to put up on the on the walls of the of the courtrooms you know not the first 10 it's just in, in the subsequent 10 or 20 that come after that is where it mentions that uh, we sh- you shall not uh, charge interest on loans to other Jews because you know again we're we're talking about racist things uh, we're talking about when a woman is raped right the, the uh, she will either have to be murdered under one set of circumstances the victim has to be murdered under the, uh, or the victim has to be forced to marry the rapist. Right. Right? I mean, this is the, these are options. And, and, um, and it did different circumstances. But and, and if she's forced to marry the rapist, then she's never, she is forbidden to ever divorce him. Why do you have to throw in extra punishments? Is it just, a, is it so <laughs> it's not that bad she enough. has to, she, so that she has to weigh, is it in equal options? To just see, do, do they kill me or do they force me to marry the rapist? Which is worse? Let me decide. Oh, gosh, this is hard. But then it also talks about slavery, and it talks about how brutally you can whoop your slave. Oh, slavery in the Bible isn't like slavery in America. Yes, it absolutely is, because you can beat your slaves so severely that that they can't get up for two days, or that you knocked their eye out, or something along those lines. Yeah, There's there's provisions for that. This is how badly you can beat up your slaves. And remember, there's the death penalty for anything. So you can you can kill them under the slightest provocation, and yet just like you can kill your own children, right? Well, with the slavery thing, I, I think it's as long as they shall live a day or two. So you you can beat them so bad that they can't get up, but as long as they live twenty four plus hours and then expire, <laughs> you're covered. It and now the thing I love about the the whole commandment thing and you know it's 30 or 40 commandments that jesus puts on or uh, what's the same guy that god puts on <laughs> and and the second yeah, batch that's another problem yeah, no the, it isn't the second batch you know god's all <laughs> no, shagged out so, so moses has to carve it but in between when when moses has his hissy fit and smashes the tablets so no one can read them uh except for the written down uh he then has them take the the golden idol, that's not a calf necessarily, but a golden idol, and he gr- has him grind it up, and he casts it across the water and makes everyone drink it, and a spell of confusion, confusion, I almost said kofefe, comes over the entire crowd, and he tells them to lash their swords to their sides and look for their friends and family. I call it the world's first friends and family plan until 3,000 of them are dead right after he just got told not to murder. Yeah, and then he was told, uh, he he gets told, thou shalt not kill. And then you turn the page and it says, kill every man and his brother. Yeah. And the amusing thing about that is, who's the problem here? There's only one man who is the problem, and it's Moses' brother. Aaron was the one that created the the golden calf. So shouldn't Aaron be the only one killed? No, they managed to kill 30,000 people. And not only, not only did they not kill Aaron. But suddenly, when you turn the page again, he's being given priestly robes covered in jewels. This is the kind of guy that would make a back-channel communications with Russia, right? <laughs> I mean, yeah, this, this is what we used to think about, the, you know, the, the organized crime syndicate. I mean, <laughs> and this is so much corruption. And it's amazing to me that anybody manages to believe anything that's in here. Because, I mean... The, the the contradictions are not just subtle things like giving different numbers for different things. You know, where one chapter says, well, you know, it was thirty thousand people, and the other chapter says it was sixty. You know, other things like you know who owned the land that Judas died on, you know, and how did he die? Because it's awfully hard to fall headlong when your head is tied to a tree. You know, things like that. Well, now, do you uh, recall the story of uh, God coming 
to uh, smite Moses himself and how he got out of that? Because his wife yeah. chopped the foreskin off their, their son's penis and threw it at his feet. And, and this deactivated God. Yeah, it's, it's, it's magic. I mean, it, it's, it makes <laughs> Harry Potter look sophisticated. I mean, Just it, the, the very idea that God needs to make an attempt to kill someone. Yeah, he's got to track him down. What didn't he know? And God can be thwarted in that. That God can be beaten in a wrestling match. Yeah, that's a good way. Or you can actually hide from God in the only fucking place that exists, the Garden of Eden, because he comes down and he's going, Marco, Adam and Eve, where are you? Marco. He can't find them. And then when he finds them, he says, why are you wearing clothes? You don't know? Well, yeah, and 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 then how is it that that Abraham was able to barter God down on on laying waste to Sodom? Yes, right. If you read that discussion, <laughs> obviously God is a special kind of special. We're <laughs> we're not talking about a superior intelligence here. No, <laughs> he's got power, and he can't. He just can't focus. He just can't. You know, the the whole thing of Sodom and Gomorrah, and and of course, uh, people don't know that. The angels come and stay, and and the entire city wants to rape the angels. That's where the word sodomy comes from. And Lot goes out and says, no, 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 you don't want to do this evil thing, but you can have my daughters. Yeah, and and this is is what makes him the most righteous in God's eyes. He's the guy that that he surrenders his daughters as if they're they're mere property. They're only girls. Right, that's right. So it's okay if you rape them to death. And then when they don't take that offer and he ends up alone with the girls in a cave somewhere, get this, he ends up so drunk that he impregnates both of them and the story he tells is that they conned him into doing it. The, 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 of all of the unbelievable nonsense in the Bible, and 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 that's do you remember, right up there. Do you remember why they conned him into doing it? Because they have to repopulate the planet, and there's well, that, only his well, seed. That's that's true, but because he has no descendants, because again, they're only women; they don't count. All they can do yeah. is produce babies and. You know, of course, you have to really, really be careful with alcohol to get so drunk that you don't remember what you're doing, but yet you're still able to perform. Yeah, and I that, that amount of alcohol, the amount of alcohol that it would be required to get me to do that to my kids is more alcohol than would allow me to be functional. Yeah, it, it's just it just amazing. Like I said, of all the unbelievable things in the story, I mean, that that, that's, that nonsense excuse about, oh, well, they, they got me drunk and, and took advantage of me. Yeah, yeah, sure they did. <laughs> but another one of my favorite options as we talk about this, you know, is the whole serpent thing. Yeah. Uh-huh. Right? And, yep. and how the serpent is supposed to be Satan. And I love this stone because, you know, here's the, the story is the way that God cursed the serpent is mm-hmm. that, you know, <laughs> Uh, you you will crawl on your belly all of your days, and you will eat dust right forever. And then we get the the very first time that Satan is mentioned by name, he's God's buddy, and there he's walking around. And again, God doesn't know where he is, right? He says, "Hey, where have you been?" Oh, I was just wandering around, you know. Yeah. And so he's re- walking, and they never had a falling out. God and Satan are buds. And of course, and they, they had the one dollar bet over Job, right? Yeah, and then God gets to use the excuse that the devil made him do it. Yeah, well, can, can the devil make him do it? That, then what powerful God are <laughs> well, you? Well, it was a bet. <laughs> yeah. So that, what do you say about gambling in that case? You know, but, but there's so many contradictions. I mean, you know, we have where the seven deadly sins and God is encumbered with at least half of them, you know, on top of being inept in all things. And then when you get, you know, people say, well, you, the way that we know that the serpent of the garden was Satan was beginning, even though it's the very first book of the Bible, is we turn to the very last book of the Bible, and it says that, that, that Satan was that old serpent. But it doesn't mean he was that old serpent. It, it, it was a common insult. I mean, in the middle of the book, you get Jesus to, saying that the Pharisees were a den of vipers and that they were all the spawn of Satan. But, he does, but even though he said that they were vipers and they were the spawn of Satan, he did not mean... Yeah. That they were actually the spawn of Satan, or that they were actually snakes, and he wasn't talking in parables either. Well, and there's the whole, uh, you know, we're talking about Egypt now, that the hardening of the heart of Pharaoh, where uh, he wants to let the Jews go, and God says, no, I'm going to harden your heart until I get to wipe out every first fucking born. 
What because God is so fantastically lonely that he sits on both sides of the chessboard. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um. And so that, that, that serpent in, in Revelations, by the way, has seven heads and is standing on the beach. So very clearly we're not talking about a serpent, it's standing. And we're not talking about the serpent in the garden either because it's standing. And I would think that the, 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 the Genesis story should have mentioned whether that serpent had seven heads. Yes, yeah. one of the details you'd think would come up yeah, in the story. You, you would think. But, of course, uh, <laughs> you know, Christians get offended when they wrongly think that uh, evolution says you came from monkeys, uh, but they're okay coming from dirt or a rib, apparently. That's okay. Yeah, or a golem spell, something yeah. something along those lines. And the, the reason that they give for belief is mystifying to me. I mean, they, they actually think that there's a moral connection there, and I want to, to mention that again, because where does morality come into this? And Because God doesn't judge people by moral acts. He judges people on thought crime. So you're forbidden to think the wrong thing, right? You can be damned for doubting. Right. You need to believe Impossible nonsense for no good reason. You need to believe it on faith. All sins may be forgiven if you but believe. But the only sin that will not be forgiven is the sin of disbelief. So gullibility is the sole criteria for redemption. Because if, you, if you're a believer and you've done all kinds of horrible things, all you need to do is just accept Jesus and you, it, it's all Oof. absolved. No problem, no foul. But if you don't believe, then it doesn't matter how good you are. You could be a saintly, charitable person your entire life. But so sorry, you didn't believe, and there's no option for good atheists to get into heaven. As a matter of fact, the Bible says they don't even exist, which is another one of the things that you can prove is wrong, right? Not even one unbeliever has ever done a good thing, according to the Bible. How many different exceptions do we need to show for that? To prove that wrong, and, and how, where where has the Bible not been proven wrong? Like on everything, you realize that the Bible t the Bible describes the Earth as a flat disk covered well, with yeah, a giant flat crystal dome. That all the planets, the sun, moon, that the sun and the moon are the same size, and that they're bigger than all the stars, and all the stars and, and the sun and the moon are all encased within this uh, snow globe, this dome that's over the Earth. Nobody even pays any attention to this. Ma, what's a firmament? I don't know. All right, well, I'll just move on then. Yep, just believe in God. <laughs> well, and like Christopher Hitchens' uh, famous, I'll paraphrase, I'm sure, but uh, you know, heaven becomes a celestial North Korea where you must uh, be always believing and always accepting and never, never doubting because, like you said, the thought crime and and you're out. Who sets up a system like that? That's crazy. And it's when it's when the desperation is the make believe when it's the illusion and you can't let the house of cards come down. There's like so many episodes of the twilight zone. I mean, there's a lot of episodes of the twilight zone that are actually based on this kind of idea where you have to maintain this belief. And if you let go of the belief then everything collapses, it's not whether it's true or not. That's not what matters. It's whether you can convince yourself that it's true. You just have to believe hard enough. And I think actually the, the, the one Twilight Zone episode that comes the closest to the way I understand Christianity is the one called, oh, what is, what that, is that episode called? I can't remember the name of the episode, but it's the one that has little Anthony Fremont. And he's a, he's a little boy of about six years old, and he has God powers. Oh. And anybody in his, his sphere of influence, he, he removed his small town from the rest of the world so that nobody can come in or out. Nobody gets any goods or anything. The rest of the, the, rest of the world may be gone for all they know. But there's this little six-year-old boy who turns people into horrible monstrosities. He tortures people I mean, because he has, he has these godlike thought abilities. And whatever he wishes comes true, and instantly he just glares at you and turns you into a jack-in-a-box or something like this. And, you, and it could, because he can read your mind, you have to think nice thoughts. And so you, you can never correct him or criticize him or argue with him. You have to praise him for every horrible thing he just did to your beloved spouse. You have to praise him for those things. When he destroys your children, you have to tell him what a good thing it was that he did that, or else he'll do something unspeakable to you. And so this is my concept of going to heaven and spending eternity, which is bad enough. Just, just being in eternity anywhere under any conditions, and eternity is too much. Any heaven would become hell 
in an eternity, but make it an eternity where I'm with this indomitable despot with miraculous powers and telepathy where I have to never be, where I can never think a free thought safely ever. Yeah, it doesn't sound like some place I want to go to. And plus, you know, he's <laughs> he's a douche. It just I I don't want to uh, be around this guy. So, uh, Aaron, where can people reach you? Uh, again, tell us about the uh, Patreon and the uh, donation page, so that maybe you can make some money out of this. Well, thank you very much indeed. Uh, uh, Patreon dot com forward slash a r o n r a. I make a half a dozen videos a month. Uh, these include podcasts with him. It's a progressive podcast, by the way. Uh, I try to seek out people who are, uh, you know, rather than making complaints, you know, as everybody can do, I want to talk to the people who are actually taking action to make things better. And so those are the people that I, that I interview on my podcast. I also do uh, educational videos, classroom supplement videos, teaching biology to middle school and high school students. And these are on the Living Science Lessons uh, uh, YouTube channel and also on my own channel. And then I also have a number of different types of activism videos. And right now I'm working on a series, for example, for um, uh, how different fields of study disprove Noah's flood. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and, I, and I'm having some fun with that one. I'm also director of the Phylogeny Explorer Project, which still hasn't been published. We're trying to do. Uh, we're trying to get some people to do a, a website landing page. But what we have done over the course of the last year is a dozen or so volunteers working on this kind of regularly have put in unbelievable volumes of data we still want to put in illustrations and some other enhancements so that it'll be it'll be easier for people to walk their way through but what it is is uh, we're trying to establish the entire phylogenetic tree of life as a navigable online encyclopedia and what we have so far is uh, is a beautiful thing if you know how to read it as i said i want to put some illustrations in there That'll, that'll help guide people who who don't obviously know these things. And so I'm making a, a, a number of videos to go along with this where I also explain the cladistics, and I'm two or three episodes into that. I, and, and if you want to support my campaign, once again, that is A-R-O-N-R-A dot org. Uh, much appreciated. And, uh, and patreon.com forward slash A-R-O-N-R-A. I need as many subscribers as I can get. If you, if you donate a dollar a video, that's six dollars a month that you'd be out and, uh, and you know, under, the, under the minimum donation. And, of course, I, it, I could accept a good deal more. I it try to be, and I'm being sincere here, I, I try to be the hardest working atheist activist there is because, of the, you know, I'm, I am doing this full time and I want to be worth it. Well, so I'm doing it's, everything it's, I can to do that. It's one of those things I tell people, you know, we've got people sitting row after row in a church giving 10% of their income and... I, I did blogging for about five years, and I, I rose to the level of insignificance. And, of course, uh, thankfully, the podcasting <laughs> does much, much better for me. I, I, I'm definitely a better speaker than a writer, and I'm not even that good speaking. But, uh, you know, almost 10 years ago when I did my first blog post, it was an appeal for people to donate money. Because if you want people to be able to do things that Arn Ra does or that I do, now I've got a different model, so I make enough money, but... Uh, Aaron Ra and other people like him, you, you got to kick in, folks. It, it's just how this shit works. And at some point, he's going to have to get a real job if, uh, or, or he could become a, pol- become a politician. But, uh, you know. <laughs> it, it, yeah, it, and the just, politician, of course, you know, be, let's be real. That is a long shot. Yeah. But, as far, but otherwise, I mean, this is my only income. And as I said, I, I'm doing everything I can to be worth it and make as much of an impact as I possibly can. I do, I do speaking at conferences and conventions and other such things. I do uh, lectures in colleges on occasion. I also give testimony uh, at various places of government, whether it's the Board of Education or whether, the, whether it's the House of Representatives and so forth. I mean, I am as active as I possibly can be. Well, great. Aaron, thank you so much for being on the show. And uh, once we get off, i got to go and log in and uh, send my contribution. I really appreciate what you do. And you are a shining light for the uh, future of humanity, and I appreciate it very much. Thank you very much, sir. You're listening to The Bill Ferguson Show. So once again, I have a show considerably longer than I expected, so forgive me. Hopefully you enjoy the longer show. I'd like to keep it around an hour or less if for no other reason. I have attention deficit disorder, and I like short podcasts. But again, hopefully you enjoyed it. Uh, so I'm going to wrap up quick. I'm not even going to read reviews. We'll, we'll bump those to next week. I'm sure we're going to have time. But I did want to mention, 
and I actually intended to do this earlier, but in the coming weeks, I expect to have a guest with us, Mandisa Thomas. Uh, I think she is the president. Maybe, uh, maybe she's not currently. I have to double check. But she is involved with Black Nonbelievers, and they're going to do a cruise this year. So you want to check that out. Maybe you can get some tickets and go with them. It's going to be fun. Uh, and hopefully a week or two after that, I am going to have on a re- recurring guest, uh, David Silverman, president of American Atheists. So he's going to be on, and we are going to talk about the late summer conference and the solar eclipse, that uh, total solar eclipse, mind you, that the American Atheists have managed to arrange specifically for their conference. So it's all about us. It's all about the atheists. So you're going to want to listen to those shows. You're going to want to find out more. And I might even be doing some more matching. So please find somewhere, someplace to donate some money. We had on today Arn Ra and Camp Quest. I did not really want them to run together, but they're both great content. So please go give to one or the other or both. I will not be offended if you give to both. Uh, And otherwise, I look forward to seeing you. And I think the next event that I have coming up is Gateway to Reason in St. Louis. And I hope, hope to see you there. Please feel free to come up and say hello. And I'll talk to you soon. Ciao.